All right, so welcome to week four, day two. We're gonna talk about integer overflow today, and we're gonna talk about range-based for loops for strings. So, uh, integer overflow and underflow are some of the hardest bugs to find, um, track down inside of your code. It's right up there with like having an uninitialized variable. Um, the student in the previous section said, you know what is um, the downside to doing this? And the answer is like probably nothing. Um, it's probably safe. Um, but what if uh, it doesn't read a value in there? I think it defaults to zero, I'm not positive. It just makes me feel a lot safer to always initialize any of the primitive, any of the built-in types, always initialize them to zero, no matter what. Unless I guess you're gonna initialize them to you know, some other value that you need, you know, like uh, time remaining 60 seconds or something, that's fine too. But if you, if you don't have any particular value to initialize a variable to, you should always initialize it to zero. Any, any type that is uh, in green here, that is a built-in primitive type that is part of the core language itself. None of the types in the core language that I can think of initialize themselves. They all, uh, if, you, if you don't initialize them, it won't waste the CPU cycle initializing it. Um, and so some students won't initialize variables because they're like, look at how much faster my code is. And to which I say, your CPU runs 4 billion times a second, give or take a billion. You can, you can, you can set a variable to zero. And even if it doesn't come up today, if you get into the habit of not initializing your variables, then at some point it's going to come back and bite you in the ass. And the bugs that result from having uninitialized variables are some of the worst to track down because you run your code and it's zero. You know, you uninitialize it, it's zero, zero, zero. And then someday it's not zero. Or you change your compiler settings and it's not zero now. Um, and now your code breaks and you don't know why. There's a if it's two lines of code, you can find the bug. If it's a million lines of code, good luck. Good luck finding the bug. So fortunately these days we have something called undefined behavior sanitizer that can help uh, identify uses of uninitialized variables and things like that. But in general, uh, this is one of those things that I just have to like keep repeating over and over again with students is just always initialize any of the default primitive types, int, float, char, double, um, always initialize them to zero unless, unless there's some other value you need to initialize them to, you know, points per touchdown, six, right, whatever. Um, I, I help students all the time, obviously. I'm on Discord 24 seven almost, and um, I uh, help students out on Reddit as well, just random people. And the first thing I look at anytime they're like, my code is running some of the time, right? And some of the time wrong. First thing I look for is them using an uninitialized variable. And it's, it's that maybe half the time. And they just never got into the habit of initializing. I've, I've been teaching computer science a long time. I've seen a lot of bad code. This is one of those things where you just want to bite the bullet. It's four extra letters of typing. I understand. It's kind of a pain in the ass to type four extra letters. I get it. But it will it will save you lots and lots of headaches in the long run. So, yeah. You, you want to you wanna just do that. Uh, strings, by the way. Note how string doesn't turn green. Um, strings are actually a class that are part of the string class. Uh, you don't know what a class is yet, but um, the uh, string class will actually initialize itself. So you actually don't need to initialize a string. Uh, that is A-OK. -okay. It's got a built-in initializer for it. The primitive types do not. The primitive types will not initialize themselves unless you tell them to. And they do that to um, as a performance thing. So, okay. So chars are a primitive, right? Char C is equal. See how it's green? If you try out putting this value, you know, this is undefined behavior. You have, there is no way of knowing what value is going to be printed if you do this. Could be anything. Probably is going to print nothing. Warning, it's used on initialized, yeah, I know. It's probably gonna print nothing, but there's no guarantee. You don't know. It might, it might not. Or someday, you know, 
uh, the compiler upgrades its version and it changes, or you change your compiler flags and it changes. You have no idea. You have no idea what this is going to print. You think you know, because you print it and it prints nothing. You think you know, but you don't know. It's literally undefined behavior. There, it could, it could literally print uh, two letters to the screen. That would be fine. It's undefined behavior. Undefined behavior means the compiler can do anything it wants, and that would be fine. That would be conformant to the standard. It could actually start playing the Macarena through your audio system, which makes no sense, but it could do it because it's undefined behavior. Once you're on undefi undefined behavior, literally anything the compiler chooses to do is conformant to the standard. So get into the habit of always initializing your variables. Okay. And you might be like, wait, why are you initializing a letter to zero? Well, surprise, um, chars are actually just ints that range from negative 128 to 127. Surprise, we don't treat them that way. If you see in a char, um, if you see in a char, um, it reads a letter. It doesn't read in, uh, yeah. um, it reads in a letter, but it's actually storing it as a number. So like if you read in a letter and then you see out the letter, like it, it basically works the way that you think. Um, reading the letter B, it outputs B, reading the letter five, it outputs the letter five, not the number five, but outputs the letter five. If we were to convert this to an int, then we can see what is actually being held behind the scenes. So if we type in letter lowercase a, we get 97. If we type in capital A, we get 65. Huh? What? Yeah. So there is something called the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, ASCII, which defines what the first 128 uh, values mean in terms of like letters and stuff like that. So uh, A is the number 65, B is the, the letter B, the character B is the number 66. So behind the scenes, a char is actually just an integer. However, C++ will sort of hide the fact that it is an integer and will make it look like, oh yeah, I'm the letter A. No, behind the scenes, it's actually just a number that's holding the number 65, okay? And lowercase a is down here at 97. So if you're wondering why exclamation mark is 33 and Z is 90, um, why there's no rhyme and reason to it, um, the answer has to do with how earlier systems did it. And so ASCII copied the earlier systems. Um, and you can just kind of keep going back in time you know, as far as you want. Um, I think probably to the telegraph as to where this stuff came from. And then if you go into the future, UTF-8, which is the most common Unicode standard, uh, if you if you say, hey, Unicode, uh, UTF-8, what is the value of capital A? It'll be like 65. So UTF-8 copied ASCII. So the first 128 code points in UTF-8, the most common Unicode standard are this and this came from old teletype machines from the 1920s and where did those come from you know and and all these things just build on top of each other okay and if you ever want to see what the values are you can always type man man stands for manual man ascii will give you the man page for ascii which shows you what all the different numbers are if you care which probably um Maybe, maybe you care. Maybe you do care. You're, you're computer science majors and math majors and stuff. So maybe you care that exclamation mark is secretly 33 behind the scenes. But we'll, we'll actually see in a little bit an example of where, where that will actually come up, which uh, involves alphabetizing. But we need to talk about a couple things before then, um, which is integer overflow and underflow. Oh, we also need to talk about our um, competency exams. So let me, let me put a hold on this. So let's do to do uh, overflow, underflow, string comparison, range based for loops. These are our topics for today. We'll talk about nuclear Gandhi too. So let's talk about the uh, competency exam, which is somewhere over here. 
There we go. Uh, there wasn't a hard deadline on it, apparently, so a couple students tried turning it in late. Uh, nope, sorry, you're not getting graded. Uh, try take two, it's due on September 6th at midnight. Okay, so if we go to competence and for branches take one and review that, quiz statistics, you'll see that there is a nice spread of scores. Obviously, it's harder than the daily quizzes, which you guys have actually been doing pretty well on. You've been uh, pretty solid on the uh, on the daily quiz front. Um, your favorite uh, nuclear Gandhi, yeah, and nuclear Gandhi is a, a very meme-worthy uh, bug, very famous bug in computer science, which uh, apparently may or may not be true, but I seem to recall it being true. So I don't know. Who knows? It might be like the Mandela effect. Who knows? Okay, so uh, you needed a 75% or higher to pass. If you got a 75% or higher, then you get 100%. And uh, if you're like, I don't see it in my grades yet, it's because I haven't put it in the grades yet. But you, you will have, if you have a three or four on the first competency exam, you don't have to take the second competency exam and your grade will be adjusted up to a four. Okay. So uh, I give you one, one question for free, essentially. I don't make you retake it if you missed one. So these questions are not trick questions, but at the same time, they're harder questions than um, the normal, okay? Because this is the equivalent of a midterm or a final. So let's go through it. Why won't this block of code compile? It should print out x is equal to three when x is equal to three and x is not equal to three otherwise. So we've got our standard uh, four reasons why code doesn't work here. Um, missing curly braces, 18 people said it's missing a curly brace. Nope. Um, uh, I've, I've emphasized this point many times. If you have one line of code, you do not need curly braces. Um, if you have one line of code, like the curly braces here uh, are optional. I could have actually deleted these curly braces. It would have worked just fine. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you were like, well, this needs to be inside of int main or something, but I didn't say a complete program. I said a block of code. A block of code is like a code snippet, a little chunk of code. That way I don't have to put an entire program on there and then you guys have to parse an entire program in the <laughs> time limit you know just highlighting this chunk of code okay so we got a variable named x which i do initialize to zero go me cn into x which it looks like there's an extra space there actually literally unplayable okay if x double equals three obviously there is a missing open close parentheses there so that needs to be if open parentheses x double is equal to three Close parentheses. That's the missing parentheses. Okay. Uh, we're not missing any curly braces. It is fine without curly braces. Bad indentation is probably from a Python programmer who is now learning C++. Uh, Python is infamous for its um, refusal to compile code if the indentation is with spaces instead of tabs or vice versa or whatever. Um, no, C++ does not care. If you want, you can write an entire program uh, more or less on one line of code. The hashtag includes can't be, um, but uh, oops. you could do this if you wanted. Uh, if you wanted to troll your uh, fellow coworkers, you could literally put everything onto one line of code. You know, that's. Uh, uh, you know, you're going to cause people to get aneurysms and have strokes and die an early death. But you can do it. You can put um, pretty much everything in C++ onto a single line. Um, don't do that, by the way, if you get paid. If you get paid per line of code, don't do that. <laughs> Congratulations, you're a World of Warcraft. How many lines of code was it? One! All right, here's a dollar. <laughs> don't do that. Um, and if you're getting paid by line of code, then you do this, by the way. Float f, f is equal to zero. Char c, c is equal to zero. You gotta pad your lines, you know. You gotta, you gotta, <laughs> gotta make the. <laughs> I, I I I've never worked for a company that paid per line of code, but uh, one of my coworkers did, and they would do just horrible stuff like this. It's all technically correct. It's not like they were doing, it's not like they were doing this or something, but uh, just everything they did was very expansive instead of a for loop, you know, and anti equals zero, i is less than 10, i plus plus, see out hello world. You know, they could copy paste hello world 10 times. So that would look a little bad, it would look a little suspicious. So instead what they would do is say, you know, like 
and I equals zero. While I is less than 10. And then this goes on its own line. And then I plus plus. And that goes on its own line. Everything becomes very, very vertically stretched out, you know. Instead of that, you do that, you know. <laughs> it just results in some of the worst code, you know, you've ever seen. So I can't imagine being paid by line of code. That's uh, JS code minified. Yeah. Yeah, minified code looks uh, <laughs> like this. Where it just mer it, it eliminates all white space. Because if you're going to be um, transmitting over the internet program, you know, which is what JavaScript is, it transmits a program to your computer to run, you need to eliminate all wasted space. And so typically variable names get replaced by single letters. So you can see here you got variables A and B, you know. So just everything gets compressed down as much as possible. And then, it's and then it gets zipped, essentially, in flight, zlib, and then transmitted to your to your browser. Um, yeah, but this is the opposite. This is getting paid by line of code, and it is absolutely garbage. And, and you know that a company has no concept of computer science when they're like, oh, well, yeah, we'll just pay you by line of code. You know? And so, oh, look, my, look at how more, I, I, I was writing 40 lines of code a day. Now I'm writing 200. Look at how productive I've become. Wow, you're so good. You definitely deserve that extra $200 bonus, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe it's a good job. I don't know. Like, you know, I'd, I'd probably take a job like that. You get paid per line of code. All right. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 100 P there we go. I could have added a hundred <laughs> to I just do it the, the old fashioned way. <laughs> Copy paste and yeah. And if I want to become a millionaire, man, rather than uh, I is equal to a million, you know, <laughs> YY999999P. Nine, 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 there you go. I'm a millionaire now. It's easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyhow, the point is, is that um, indentation, yeah, that's pretty, I guarantee you that's not going to be an issue. Um, the only time it might matter is like if you try sticking something after an IO stream or something like that, like if you try typing code there, um, it won't work. That's the only time that white space matters. Worth in a string or something. Okay. Missing a semicolon? Nope. All, every statement has to have a semicolon at the end of it. Uh, conditionals are not statements, they're expressions. So you need the parentheses. An expression is anything that goes within parentheses, like algebra, 2 plus 2 is an expression. But x equals 2, or x equals 0, is a statement. So that sets a value. That's statement, expression, a little bit of vocab, doesn't really matter. Point is, we're not missing a semicolon anywhere. And no answer is, uh, <laughs> just pick something. Like, I don't mark you down for a wrong answer. So, you know, just take a gamble on it. Um, Pro tip, never pick that indentation. Although now that I've said that, maybe I'll put it on the third competency. I don't know how I could do that, but what's wrong with the style of this code? That, ideas, ideas. Okay, so uh, do you know any company that does violin code? No, but like I said, one of my former bosses worked for a place like that. And it, and, it, and, it, and it worked about as well as you can imagine. Just all the code is just stretched like vertically like that. Like nobody ever does any compound statements, just it, just tiny little lines, very narrow, very tall. You know. <laughs> Impossible to understand without page upping and page downing. Okay, so suppose you want to code uh, uh, a floating point average. So you're going to take two integers as input and output a floating point average. Floating point average means if you punch in 4 and 5, it will output 4.5. And so this comes down to um, Mixing ints and floats, the um, thing we've talked about a couple times in here. So we've got ints here, we read them in, all this code's fine, your code goes into that line here. So, uh, some people picked this one, which is taking x plus y and multiplying by zero. It looks like one half, but that's just zero with more steps. One is an integer, two is an integer. If you divide one integer by one integer, you get an integer. You don't get 0.5, you get 0. 
you get zero. So this is multiplying x plus y times zero. This is just outputting zero with more algebra involved. A very long and verbose way of outputting zero. Um, this one is an order of operations problem. So if you remember, uh, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, uh, multiplication and division have higher priority in the order of operations than arithmetic. So if you do this, it will divide y by two, then add x to it, which is wrong. Okay. So uh, <laughs> it actually is correct for uh, four and five. So if you take five and divide it by two, you get two and a half, two and a half plus, no, it's wrong, it's six, six and a half, sorry. Um, yeah, no, it's just wrong. Okay, so uh, this one is taking an integer. X is an integer, Y is an integer. So if you add them, you get an integer. An integer divided by an integer is an integer. So you will get four. If X is four, Y is five, you get four. This is the right one. Why? Because you've got an integer up top. X plus Y is an integer. Dividing by a double. 2.0 is a double. Double precision floating point number. And the rule is whenever you mix integers and uh, floats, the integer becomes a float. The, the, the more general rule is anytime you have uh, numerical variables of different width or precision, as they're called, uh, the narrower one will widen to be the width of the wider one. So if you mix a float and a double, the float becomes a double. If you mix a short, which is a 16-bit integer, and an int, which is 32 bits on our system, the short becomes an int. The 16 bits widen to be 32 bits. If you have a char, which is 8 bits, it'll widen to be 32 bits if you add it to an integer. So that's the rule. Anytime you mix things of different types, um, different numerical precisions and widths and things like that, the thing with less precision widens to become the value with more precision. And so up top here, we've got an integer. Because we're mixing an integer with a double, the top part turns into a double. We don't need to cast it. We could. We could say double parentheses x plus y. That would work fine too. Uh, in fact, a lot of people do that. Like they put double parentheses x plus y divided by two. That's fine. What's up, girl? Okay. All right. So, uh, what number must x be in order for the code to print at Harambe 2020? So, not x. So, if you remember what false is, false is zero, and true is anything not zero. We think of true as one, false is zero. But two is true, three is true, four is true. Zero is the only value that's false. And so in order for this to be true, in order for not x to be true, x has to be false, because we're nodding it. So this is this is equivalent to saying if x double equals zero. If x is zero, print out Pepe. Because zero is false, not false is true. So if x is zero, it will print Pepe. If x is less than zero, it prints out Harry Potter in the Chamber of C++, which is a pun that I just made up and I'm proud of. So don't criticize it. And if X is greater than one, then it will uh, see out the infamous grief or pop bob. And otherwise it'll print out Harambe 2020. So zero is off limits. Numbers below zero are off limits. Numbers greater than one are off limits. So the answer is one. One is the only value that will print out Harambe 2020. Okay. So um, if we had a float, if this was a float, then there would be a range in there, but it's an integer. So zero, one, and zero is caught by that one. So that was uh, you know, a fair bit, fair, fair number of people got that one wrong. Uh, write a complete program that uh, will ask the user to enter their grade, which must be float and print pass if the grade is 68.9 or higher and fail it's not. So uh, let me switch over to the server and do this real fast. Um, So uh, common mistakes, a lot of people, about five or six people didn't actually output the C out statement. Please enter your grade. This is um, required, you know, the, that will ask the user to enter the grade. So you have to have a C out statement in there. Uh, you have to have a float and uh, yeah, so float F is equal to zero, CN into F. Again, uh, not, not everybody initialized the, not everybody initialized it to zero. I did not mark you off for that because it's technically correct without it. You're probably not going to notice any difference. It's just get into the habit of doing this. Okay, so please enter your grade that, and then if f is greater than or equal to sixty-eight point nine, then see out pass. 
uh, otherwise see out fail. And you can write it with the double left arrow inline, or you can write it with the backslash in, either way is fine. Um, a common mistake that a lot of people made was they didn't have the closed curly brace on main. They got down there and then just submitted it. So um, that was a common mistake. Uh, some people forgot the magic, even though it said, you know, write it including the magic. Uh, some people forgot the magic. Um, a lot of people were like including like CMath and stuff like that. Um, don't need any of that. IO streams all you need. C in and C out. And then uh, some of, some top tier students were doing like epsilon comparison, uh, which you do not need. the 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 red flag, the red flag for floats is double equals, or technically not equals also. All right. Uh, if you see that, if you see that danger. Right. Um, yeah. Like, as I'm sure some of you found out during the triangle testing assignment, that um, you could add uh, A squared and add B squared and don't get C squared, even though if you do the algebra by hand, you're like, yeah, they're the same. Because you're doing a square, which can introduce error. You're doing another square and another square that can introduce error. And then you're adding two floats together, which can also introduce error. You might get lucky and have them be the same. You might not. So, uh, yeah, and so if you're ever doing double equals, you need to do an epsilon comparison and say, all right, are the values close to each other, like really close to each other? And if they are, then say they're the same. You don't have to do it here. Why? Because it's greater than or equal to. So it'll capture equals and everything above it. So rather than being an infinitesimally small comparison, it is um, 68.9 and above. So you do not need to do that here. Okay. This is this is A-OK. -okay. Will you be able to see the questions you missed? You can uh, you can message me if you want, um, I, or I could just make it I can just make it uh, visible now. I guess. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. Uh, branches C. Take one. Edit. Let students see the quiz responses. If you stop jumping around, let you see the correct answers. So that was the branches competency exam. If you did not pass it, the next one is up. So study hard and good luck. Uh, did the grades for triangle testing get uploaded? Um, maybe, did I? I don't know. That was like all the way back on Monday. I don't remember that far away. Let me check. Yes, triangle testing is uh, posted. Oh wait, hmm, interesting. N oh no, yeah, uh, I only posted uh, one of the sections. <laughs> yeah, I, I was getting, I got halfway through this section and uh, I discovered there were like six students who had dropped and I started like purging them off the server and got distracted. So um, yeah, everybody was, whose last name is M and below in this section, uh, I'll, I'll I'll get that up right after, right after class. Okay, yeah. So two, th uh, three quarters of, of of the grades are posted. Okay. So yeah, Otal, your your last name starts with O, so uh, it'll be up after class. Sorry about that. Okay. So let's talk about overflow and underflow. These are uh, really um, really important things. So into x equals zero. Cn into x. C out x times two. Anytime you do addition, subtraction, and multiplication, there's a possible you're going to get overflow or underflow. And the answer that most computer science people have for it is to ignore the problem entirely, which is sometimes okay, it's sometimes uh, hor horrible in, in a lot of ways. Um, there was a rocket that exploded a couple of years ago um, because of integer overflow. It was going up. And then some counter overflowed and the side booster kicked on and went up like this one bloop, and then exploded. So yeah, true story. They were using a short. There was no reason for them to use a short. A short is a 16 bit number. So it counted up. It was like counting up milliseconds since launch or something like that. And it, uh, it hit 65 seconds, so about a minute up into the launch, 
engage the thrusters. Uh, what? Yeah. What happened was uh, it, it went negative, and then it got that got sent into the flight control software. Uh, no, it faulted, and then that. Yeah, there was like a whole series of events. And the really funny thing is that that variable wasn't actually being used. That variable that caused this multi-million, maybe billion, I don't know, dollar thing to blow up was because they had copied it from the previous um, iteration of the software that needed it. And that rocket actually didn't even use that variable at all. So, yeah. Smooth brain engineering. Yeah, it happens. Like, you know, you're moving from version 4 to version 5, so you copy and paste everything. Yeah. All right, so if we run this, we type in 1, we get 2. We type in 10, we get 20. We type in 1,000, 10,000, we get 20,000. We type in a million, we get 2 million. We type in a billion, we get 2 billion. We type in 2 billion, we get... Uh, Negative two nine four nine six seven two nine six, which everybody was about to say, I'm sure, right? Everybody, you're you're all about to type that, right? Like that's exactly the number that you were expecting to get. So, um, yeah, this is this is integer overflow. So integers on our system, integers are thirty two bits. Not it's not true. That's not necessarily true on all systems, but on pretty much all modern systems, integers are thirty two bits. It's a somewhat safe assumption. Um, 32 bits, you can see how many values are possible in 32 bits. Every bit's a zero or one, so there's two, two values for one bit, right? And so if you have two bits, you can hold four possible values. Three bits, you can hold eight values. 16, as you go on up, like that. And so um, if you do it 32 times, you get 4.2 billion. So an integer, there is 4.2 billion in change. Uh, possible values that an integer can hold. And if you have a signed integer, a regular integer, these are divided um, into positive and negative numbers. So you can hold about negative 2.1 billion and change and positive 2.1 billion and change. That's the range on a normal integer. And for you know a lot of purposes, and it's good enough, right? Like if you're holding hit points in a video game, um, you know, and your health ranges from 100 to 1,000 or something, you know, and it's fine. You know, as long as there's not like an exploit that would, you know, double your health over and over again or something like that, uh, which might cause problems. And even then, like if they if it got too high, their health would go negative and they would just die instantly. So it's a self-correcting problem um, for a lot of for a lot of circumstances, and it's fine. You know, it's not good if you're doing money. Two billion dollars is not that much money when you're talking about like the federal government. The federal government um, talks about trillions. The Federal Reserve treats billion as a rounding error. You know, if they do a prediction and they come within a couple billion, like they're like, yeah, we're looking how accurate we were. You know, it's cool. So, um, yeah, so for things like money, um, you know, GMP and things like that, like an int is not good enough. You need to switch to what's called a long, long. So an int, int is 32 bits. If you, you know, some people try doing this, they'll say like, all right, we'll use an unsigned it. Um, so an int ranges from negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. Unsigned int is 32 bits. That ranges from 0 to 4 billion and change. Um, that doesn't really help you very much, right? Because, you know, if we type in 2 billion, okay, cool, 4 billion. It works. Yay. So if we try 3 billion, uh, it overflows. And uh, unsigned integers make you much, much more vulnerable to underflow. Because if you ever hit negative 1, it will underflow and wrap around to 4 billion. And so unsigned integers are very dangerous to use. Even if something like, uh, like you're holding height for a person, right, in centimeters or something, you might, yeah, let's, let's do an unsigned integer for that because it can't be negative, right? Cool. Now, uh, let's say you're gonna difference the height between two people, right? So let's say you got inside, uh, inside int x and y, and uh, we're gonna read in x and y, and we're gonna output the difference in height, okay? x is 
x minus y taller than y. Okay, seems harmless, right? It seems like a nice harmless thing. Our, our values are unsigned integers. You can't have a negative, you can't have a negative, you know, value anyway, right? Heights are always positive. So if we have 10 and five, we're five units taller. If we're 20 and one, we're 19 units taller. If we have 10 and 11, we are 4.2 billion units taller. <laughs> See the promise? So, um, yeah, it's, uh, so I said, these things are very pervasive problems. Anytime you do addition, subtraction, or multiplication, you run the risk of overflow or underflow. Anytime you add two numbers, they could exceed the maximum and wrap around to the minimum. Uh, anytime you multiply, it's even more likely you exceed the maximum and wrap around to the minimum. Anytime you subtract, you can go down below the minimum and wrap around to the positive. And there have been a lot of bugs in video games as a result of this. Uh, um, let's see, last, uh, last class I talked about Trade Wars, which was um, one of the greatest games, video games. It's kind of like an MMO, sort of, um, from the uh, bulletin board system days back when we had dial-up. People would run their own servers and you would dial into it and you would uh, play Trade Wars. You'd have a certain number of moves per day, like 200 moves per day. And you'd have a spaceship and you'd travel to a space station. It's all text-based. Although I think they had a graphical client at some point. Um, you travel to a space station, you buy some cabbages, and you travel to a place where food is expensive and sell it, you make money, and then you make uh, money off all these trading, uh, arbitrage kinds of things where you buy low and sell high. You find trade routes that work, you get bigger ships with more cargo, or you uh, get ships that have better weapons on them, and you can fight other players. And um, The end game, uh, you can save up a lot of money and make... Uh, this Genesis device and actually build your own planet and populate your planet with industry and laser cannons that shoot at enemy people. And you can get these giant space carriers that have a hundred or 200 fighter ships on them and you can fight each other or you could set the fighters to guard space. It was a really cool thing. It was a neat concept and it worked really well, except it had underflow bugs in it. So they were holding, uh, they were holding their fighters in a short, an unsigned short because you can't have negative, uh, fighter ships, right? And so um, a short shorts are 16 bits. Uh, so you have 65,000 values. Okay. So if you have a short like that and uh, let's say you take some damage, you travel through a warp and 10 of your fighters are destroyed. Uh, guess what's going to happen? Anyone? Gra uh, Grand Theft Auto by City had a similar bug in it. It would overflow and underflow. Unstoppable force, yeah. Yeah, in a system where 100 or 200 fighters is pretty good, I think the biggest I got legitimately was like a thousand or two thousand or something. Um, if I had 40 fighters, I now have 30. Oops, I need a space there. Or it's literally incredible. There we go. So if I had 100 fighters before, I've got 90 now. If I had 10 before, I got zero now. If I had one before, I've got 65,527 fighters now. And so people would have a fighter, they would uh, via various means get more than one fighter destroyed, the value would underflow, wrap around to maximum, and now you've got an unstoppable force. And these fighters could actually be detached from your ship and placed into a sector and set to attack anybody that comes in that isn't part of your guild. And so somebody would walk in, it's like, surprise! And you die instantly, because 65,000 fighters was an unstoppable force. And then they would, uh, you know, uh, get infinite money uh, via, via similar means and use the infinite money to make infinite Genesis devices and then make infinite planets in every sector. And with your infinite money, build laser cannons, these big orbital cannons on each one of the infinite planets. 
and set them to attack anybody not in your guild that comes in. So if somebody walks in and there's 65,000 fighters, uh, which you could have too if you overflowed, uh, underflowed, sorry, but it, between 65,000 fighters and 65,000 laser cannons all shooting at you at the same time, you die. And so the game went from being this really fun MMO with trading and space combat and things like that at a time before the internet, right? This is on dial-up modems prior to the internet really existing. The internet existed, just nobody used it. I'm talking like 1993, 94. The internet really exploded in, in 95. So um, it went from being this really fun game to who can exploit the game the fastest. And so guilds of people would run around try and get infinite money, and then they would lock down sectors. Because once you lock down a sector with infinite planets and infinite fighters, nobody else on another team could get through there. But this galaxy was huge. There were a thousand different sectors in each one of these games, connected by hyperlines. Hy hyperlines. And so you'd race to sort of map out the world, and you only had 200 moves per day or something like that. So, you know, you'd be in a team, and you'd sort of explore and figure out where all the connections are, and then race to exploit, and then seize the choke points in the galaxy, and lock them down with infinite orbital cannons, and it became this like completely different game of like all, all, all cheaters working to sort of claim territory, and whichever one would end up with, it, and nobody could move into another team's territory because it had infinite damage on it, and so people would just sector off, uh, they just section off chunks of the galaxy, and they're like, yay, we won. It's like it's like a map coloring game, right? You're just trying to paint the galaxy your color, um, and whoever could section off the biggest chunk of the galaxy first one, you know, and then they would reboot the server and the company that made it never fixed the bug. So yeah, true story. When else are underflow is possible? Um, Baldur's Gate. So uh, Baldur's Gate 3 is coming out, all right? Here's Baldur's Gate 3, Hotfix 15 is now live. Last Baldur's Gate came out in the 90s and um, They've made some spiritual successors to it. Um, Pillars of Eternity, um, Divinity Original Sin, in a certain sense, is a spiritual successor to Baldur's Gate. They're the people that are making Baldur's Gate 3. Baldur's Gate 2, though, is one of the best computer RPGs of all time. Balder. So you can get the Enhanced Edition, um, which has support for higher resolutions and things like that. If you ever want to try it, um, can't imagine it's that expensive. 20 bucks, okay, maybe it is expensive. I don't know. But, um, yeah, it's kind of what the graphics looked like. They're not bad. They're really pre rendered 3D graphics, and you'd have people walking around. It's a pretty, pretty fantastic RPG, honestly. If you've never played the Baldur's Gate series, it's really good. The expansion's really good for it, too. And, uh, there was a monster in Baldur's Gate 2 called the Nurr. It's like a floating cloud um, that uh, if it hit you, it would drain charges off of your uh, your weapons. Um, is that it? No. Hmm. It has some sort of like terrible name. Uh, it doesn't matter what the name is. Anyway, the point is when it would hit you, it would drain charges off your magic items. And so, um, to answer your question, Otal, uh, there would be, uh, it would drain a D4 charges. A D4 means one to four charges. And so I had this short sword that had uh, three charges left on it. And the fog monster, I don't remember the name of it, destroyed, let's say it destroys four of your charges. So I had a short sword that had three charges. I got hit by the fog monster. I now have 65,535 charges. And, uh, and it was a really good weapon. It was a short sword that cast haste. And, um, Baldur's Gate 
two short sword of haste. It's got it was a named weapon. Arbane's sword of agility. Yeah, that's it. So um, uh, used once a day to haste the wielder. Yeah, and so um, it had. Uh, if this is the one I was thinking of, it had um, uh, a certain number of charges on it, and every time you used it, it would go down. And the value of the weapon was proportional to how many charges were remaining. So if you uh, were at three charges out of 10, the value of the weapon was 30%. After you underflowed it, which I did, um, the value of the weapon was now 6,553 times higher than before. And so it was effectively infinite gold. I sold it, uh, used all the money in the world to buy every magic item in the, every shop in the world. And then uh, uh, on the next reset, the weapon was available for sale from the store and its charges were reset back to normal. So I bought it again and then, you know, underfloated again. And so I had a weapon with infinite charges and I had infinite money and it made Baldur's Gate 2 a lot easier. Let me put it that way. Uh, they eventually fixed that bug, but uh, it, it worked really well for me, let me tell you. So yeah, Grand Theft Auto, um, Minecraft had various underflow and overflow bugs in it. And they're really tricky things to, to handle. Um, the most famous of which is, of course, Nuclear Gandhi, which, according to Wikipedia, is an urban legend. It never happened, which, um, I don't know. It might be the Mandela effect. I remember it happening. So, uh, the uh, thing about Nuclear Gandhi was chars are 8-bit numbers on our server. So, they hold 256 values. Okay. So, if you have an unsigned char... Uh, we think it's a letter, and in fact it is a letter in a lot of cases, and it'll, if you try outputting it, it'll output as a letter. So if we um, do something like this, and we say uh, we had uh, 67 charges, we had 69 charges before, um, it destroyed four charges, now you have two charges. If you had E charges before, now you have A charges. Because C++ is interpreting this not as a number, because it's a char, it's interpreting it as a letter. It's using the ASCII codes. And so if we were to uh, have A charges before, now we have equal charges. You see that? Why equal? Well, because A is 65. And 61 is going to be the equal sign. Okay. So if you want to treat a char as a number, which it actually is underneath the, uh, underneath the scenes, then you need to do something a little different. You need to do this int y, cn into y, x is equal to y. And you do that. So you need to read it in as an int instead of a char. If you try reading into a char, it reads it as an ASCII code, not as a number. So you do that. And then when you output it, you have to uh, convert it to an integer there as well. And so if we had 10 charges before, we have six charges now. If we had two charges before, we have 254 now. So let's talk about Nuclear Gandhi. So Nuclear Gandhi started off with an aggression level of um, one. So substitute aggression. And in Civ, I don't know if you guys have played the Civ video game series. Has anyone here played it? Anyone's played Civ, any of the Civ games? Humankind is... Uh, Humankind is kind of the latest Civ-like game that came out. Uh, where's Humankind? Right here. By the way, um, <laughs> the trophies are bugged. It gave me... Uh, be the first to reach all six eras in a single game. Mm -mm, I didn't do that. <laughs> and it gave me, when I beat it, it gave me a ton of trophies that I did not earn. A hundred percent. Advance from the Neolithic without hurting an animal. Nope, didn't do that. Be the first. Nope. Uh, that one, yes, I did get. Uh, beat it on the hardest difficulty. Uh-uh. I beat it on normal difficulty. And it gave me credit for every difficulty. Uh, <laughs> so, so if you want to play Humankind... You want those chivos? Go for it now because uh, it is getting you tons of uh, tons of uh, trophies. Win a game without declaring any wars? Mm -mm. Nope, <laughs> I declared a lot of wars, so it's just like. Pfft. So get it now before the bugs are fixed. 
Uh, so humankind's a civ like game. Yeah. Um, so uh, only little, not your genre. Uh, yes. So in the original Civ One, they stored the uh, aggression of AI. Aggression was uh, aggression was between one and ten for all AI. So uh, one was Gandhi. He's very peaceful. Wouldn't declare war. Wouldn't build much military. The highest levels uh, were Shaka Zulu and uh, Montezuma, I think, at ten. And so what happened was, um, if you built the UN, the UN was a late game wonder. Um, uh, UN built all aggression level dropped by two. Then what happens is, uh, and that needs to turn into aggression as well. So I think you can see where this is going, right? Gandhi was given an aggression of one. So when the UN was built, uh, we had, if we had an aggression of 10, we have an aggression of eight now. If we had an aggression of six, we have an aggression. If we had an aggression of six, we have an aggression of four. So uh, the point of the United Nations was you build it and then the AI would chill a little bit, right? So um, all the AI formulas were based on an understanding the aggression between one and 10. So if it was deciding, should I build a military unit? It's more likely if you're aggressive. And should I declare war? More likely if you're aggressive. And so by building the UN, it sort of makes the game a little bit more peaceful. The trouble is, is that if you enter an aggression of one, then Gandhi's aggression underflows and goes up to 255. So now in a game where the aggression ranges from one to 10, Gandhi's aggression is now 255. He is now 25 times more aggressive than Montezuma and Shaka Zulu. So Gandhi starts, he breaks your alliance with you. You were friends with him the whole game. He hasn't been building any, you know, military units. All of a sudden you build the UN, alliance broken. Gandhi retools his economy for war. He researches nuclear weapons. He builds nuclear weapons in every city, declares war on you and bathes the world in nuclear fire. And uh, this was a very famous bug, which again, apparently from what I was reading today, it's an urban legend, it didn't happen. Uh, I seem to recall it happening to me. So I don't know, could be Mandela effect, who knows. And so uh, one way or the other, it has turned into a, uh, uh, it has turned into a, it has turned into a meme. Uh, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then you nuke them, then you win, right? Like, uh, and, and it's the result of, um, um, uh, the thing underflowing, right? So Gandhi became 25 times more aggressive, right? So, um, you know, other people have said it, it didn't happen. I don't know. I, I don't want to tell you. Um, and, uh, and so there's all sorts of, uh, memes for it. Um, greetings from Gandhi, ruler and king of the Indians. Our words are backed with nuclear weapons, right? So, um, Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so it's it's and that and that you know even if it's not real, it's a great example of integer underflow. Okay, and why you shouldn't use unsigned integers except in very limited circumstances. Uh, un unsigned integers are there for uh, saving yourself an if statement, really, so you don't have to compare with zero. Um, for even if even if height or whatever is uh, never supposed to be negative. Um, it's still a good idea to just use an int anyway, so that if you ever difference two things, it doesn't suddenly turn into 4.2 billion, right? So, um, yeah. Uh, Gandhi's uh, granddaughter came to our campus a year ago, two years ago. So, uh, I got a photo with her. I, I did not ask her about nuclear Gandhi. I was kind of tempted to, but I didn't. I was good. Me. Yeah. So there's me with uh, 
Bundy's uh, granddaughter last year. Maybe it was two years ago. Yeah. I probably should have shampooed my hair or something. I don't know. She was very, she was very courteous, very nice. Um, yeah, October of 2019. Yeah, two years ago. Okay. Yeah. And um, like the uh, the person in front of me asked a question, like, you know, what can we do to promote world peace? And she gave like a half hour long answer. <clears throat> so I was like, I'm not saying anything. I'm just going to go up there, get my photo taken. I don't want to cause the line to back up anymore. You know what I mean? So. Okay. So uh, what did she come for? She gave, a, she gave a speech on like peace and you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. So <clears throat> yeah. Do you guys understand? Overflow, underflow. It's, it's okay. All right. Next up, we're going to talk about string comparisons. Do you have any other questions about this? Um, uh, if your long, long, long is 64 bits, which ranges from like five peta something bigger than billion, trillion, quadrillion, whatever the next one is, it's like around there. Pretty big numbers. Big enough to hold the US debt, that's for sure. Okay, so string comparison. So if we have string A and B, and we see an A and B, we can not just do double equals with string comparisons, but we can also do less than and greater than. So this does something called lexicographical comparison, which means like how you sort books on a bookshelf, right? So if you have two books and you're putting them on the bookshelf, you first look at the first letter and you compare those. The A's go over here and the B's go next to it and the Z's go at the end of the bookshelf. Uh, but if they're both A's, then you look at the second letter and then you sort them alphabetically on the second letter and so on and so forth. So it does what's called lexicographical comparison and you just see out A is less than B. If they're the same, a is the same as B, then A is the same as B, and if neither of those is true, then it must be that it is greater than. Okay. So let's see how this works. So if we compare uh, AAA with AAB, a, a comes first on the bookshelf, right? Uh, BBB and AA, BBB is greater, so it comes after on the bookshelf, okay? Um, if we compare apple and banana, apple's less than banana. If we compare apple and apple, as it turns out, apple is later in the alphabet than apple capital A Apple. And the reason for that is because of, again, this ASCII table here. And if, again, if you want to see what the ASCII values are, because this is, I told you, there's one time where it comes up and this is the time. Whenever you're mixing and matching lowercase and uppercase letters, uh, sometimes you want to know, wait, which one's bigger? And you think that the bigger letter is bigger, but it's not. It's not. The, the bigger letter is 65 and the smaller letter is 97. So the smaller letter has a higher ASCII value. And uh, if you are like, wait, it's 32 higher. Is that for a reason? Yeah, it is. All, all, the, all the lowercase letters are exactly 32 higher than the um, uppercase letters. And the reason for that is so you can play with the bits. It's like if you want to uppercase something, you just set that bit to be uh, false and then it'll uppercase it. So they're old school optimization techniques baked into the, the standard. So, uh, if we compare apple and banana, apple is bigger than banana because that's a lowercase a, right? And lo all the lowercase numbers are 32 higher. If we compare capital A apple with a lowercase banana, which one do you think is going to be bigger? Capital A apple or lowercase b banana? Which one do you think is going to have the higher value? Banana. You're right. Banana is bigger. And if you... Um, If you look at the uh, the dictionary on the system, there's a, a dictionary that has all the words in the English language, at least according to this file. 
you can start you see it starts off with capital A and as you go down it'll get into the capital B's and as you go down even further it'll zip zip to the bottom then it's all the lowercase ones okay and if you wonder how it like alphabetizes the apostrophe well uh, guess what it uses the same ASCII character so an apostrophe is right here so an apostrophe will sort above uh, capital A. So there's no English words that begin with apostrophe, but if there were, they would come first in the dictionary. So, uh, so the question is, what is first? A, 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 or A, 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 <laughs> with uh, the capital letter last or the capital letter first? Well, again, it's lexicographical comparison. So it looks at the first letter and says, which one's first? In this case, capital A is first, right? Because it's lower than that. So you can see that uh, this one comes last. It's, it's a bigger number. Okay. So you just go down each pair of letters one at a time. If they're the same, it goes to the next one. If it's the same, it goes to the next one. So if we have A, 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 and A, 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 which must be very awkward for people listening on audio right now, those of you that are at the Taco Bell drive through um, uh, if you have a capital letter, if you have lowercase, capital, lowercase, that is lower than lowercase, lowercase, uppercase, right? Because it checks the first pair of letters, then it checks the second pair of letters, then it checks the third pair of letters. Okay. So it's pretty common. Uh, if you, it, 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 These things are kind of annoying to deal with, right? Like this is kind of an annoying problem if you're trying to like just sort students in the class and some of the students are typing their names in all caps and some are typing them in lowercase. Like the, the alphabet is... It just gets all screwed up, right? Like if we have Stover versus uh, Patrick, right? Um, like the alphabet, you know, it just, you know, it just messes up the alphabetization. For a lot of our purposes, we just want, you know, just case insensitive, right? And so we talked last time about um, uppercaseifying something. And so if we want to uppercaseify these two strings, we can say for size i equals zero, i is less than a dot size, i plus plus, and um, a dot at i is equal to two upper, a dot at i, there. so this will uppercase if I a string, but uh, there's actually a faster way of doing it. So here is a brand new for loop. Okay, and this is what the quiz of today is going to be on. So another way we could do it, uh, another and equal way, is with a range based for loop. For it's called a for each loop in some languages. For each letter in the string. Do you see the difference? This is for i is equal to zero to less than the size. So this is talking about like the index of the string, like the uh, letter index zero, letter index one. Instead, we're gonna say for each character. So for each character in the string, so for each character in the string, we're gonna set that character equal to the two upper version of that character. Okay, so for each character in the string, set that character to be the uppercase version of the character. Does the exact same thing as this, smaller, more concise, more compact. It always runs over the whole string. You can't have it go over like half the string without shenanigans. Uh, this one, you could like go over like half the string by dividing by two here or something, but this is, um, you can one line it really if you want. Um, and then we could do the same for B, All right? So for every uh, character in B, uppercase fight. And now if we compare Apple and Apple, it's the same. Okay. So this is a one line, one line uppercase by function. So range was for a simple, easy, easy breezy, beautiful cover girl. She wasn't born with it. It's Maybelline, I don't know, something. So that is your range based for loop. That is what the quiz is going to be on. Um, just to make sure you're here for the last 10 minutes of class. And the character name is C. So the, uh, the ampersand here means that you want to be able to change C. If you don't have it there, if you don't have that ampersand, then the, this is not um, the letter in the string. It's a copy of the letter. And uh, this will make a little more sense after you learn functions. Um, but 
Uh, basically, just do this for now. You'll, you'll be fine. Just memorize that as a formula. And it's a different syntax, right? But uh, it was introduced in C++11, so if you go to an institution that doesn't allow you to use C++11 because it's too new, it came out 10 years ago, we're not used to it yet, it's too new, um, <laughs> then you'll, you'll have to do it the old way. Okay. Uh, barf. <laughs> not, not that it's bad, it's just I don't get institutions that are like, eh, we can't use modern C++. Came out in 2011. Man, nobody's got time to keep up to date like that. Okay, so for your homework assignment, you're going to be doing uh, what's called a nested for loop. And um, you're going to be making, it's a very simple homework assignment. It's a half point homework assignment. It is um, worth five points instead of 10. Because I'm basically going to give you the code for it right now. So uh, it's going to give you practice doing what's called a nested for loop, which is a for loop inside of a for loop. So int i equals 0, i is less than 10, i plus plus. Okay, so for int i equals 0 to 10, j is equal to 0 to 10, c out i times j followed by the tab character, and then after we get to the end of a row, we're going to hit new line. And so what this is going to do, it's going to start off with i is equal to 0, and when i is equal to 0, we're going to loop from j is equal to 0 to j is equal to 9, and it's going to output the uh, multiplication of 0 times 1, 0 times 2, 0 times 3. We're doing the times table here, that's the assignment by the way, with a tab in between. The backslash t means tab, and then after we print the first row, we hit return, do the same for the next row. So if we compile this, nested for loop, this then you'll see we get the times table from 0 to 9 basically. Now let's say we wanted 1 to 10 and you could do this instead. It does break the pattern and I apologize that it breaks the pattern. Every once in a while you can break the pattern. It's fine. I'm not gonna get I'm not gonna get too upset about it. It's fine. So now look we have the times table from 1 to 10. Now, if we want to do 1 to 12 if you were one of those advanced students that got the the times table up to 12, well, there you go. So there's the times table. So 1 to 12, 1 to 12, 12 times 12 is 144, 7 times 8 is 56. Yep. And so this is a for loop inside of a for loop. And this is your homework assignment. You have to make a program that outputs a times table. And, uh, and uh, so there's a little more complexity to it. The user can enter the starting number. The user can enter the ending number. I'm not going to tell you what numbers you need to change for the ending number or for the starting number, but you know, it's somewhere within the highlighted area there, you're going to have to replace that with a variable. <laughs> so the uh, CD uh, times table that reference. So the program's going to look like this. Oh, and you can also do an addition table. So you have to impl implement an, ad an addition table. Uh, I don't want to, again, I don't want to like spoil it for you or anything like that, but somewhere within the highlighted area you're going to change a star to a plus i don't want to i don't want to make it too easy but somewhere within the area that is highlighted on the screen you're going to change a star to a plus okay. times table smallest number of one largest number of 12 there you go now what you might notice is that there's a little bit extra and this little bit extra is kind of your your homework assignments do a week from today because monday there's no class so you have to print uh column headers like this which is just the ones times table and the top left corner you have to indicate if you're doing times or if you're doing addition so if it's times you put an x there if it's addition uh one to ten you put a plus there okay so five plus nine is 14 okay so you output um essentially the ones row twice and uh you do a column header here as well which is also the ones row kind of um figure it out that's your that's your assignment. I've given you literally all the other code you need for this. There is some vetting uh, if the user types in something that's not one or two. If the user types in squirrel, um, you have to vet it, handle it. Um, if the smallest number is 100 and the biggest number is one, the smallest number is bigger than the biggest, you can't do that. So. Um, and the biggest table size is 20. So if you do one to 20, that's fine. If you try doing 1 uh, to 40, can't do it. That's your assignment. You have a week to do it. And um, that's that's basically the that's basically the heart of it right there. Okay. 
Any questions about the homework? It's already been pushed out to your directories. Worth five points. Due next Wednesday. Start a class. Looks good. Yeah. I, I gave the other class an option to do a harder assignment, and they turned it down for some reason. I don't know. The max number is 20. That's in the readme. You don't have to pay attention to me at all. <clears throat> yeah, I know, right? Like, I was like, uh, I don't know if you've ever played the Mastermind game where, like, there's, like, a sequence of six digits and you have to, like, guess, you know, like, all right, three, four, or five, and it's like, all right, you got two numbers right, but three of them are in the wrong place, you know? I offered that to them and they're like, nah, it just goes times table. I'm like, all right, whatever. It's Labor Day weekend. Like, I don't, I don't want to kill you. So do you do either a times table or add? Yeah, like when you run it, it prompts the user. Do you want an addition table or do you want a times table? So you got to have both in there. And again, I'm not going to tell you what you have to change, <clears throat> but um, it's somewhere within the highlighted area right here. That's the only difference between a times table and an addition table. So, <coughs> yeah. Uh, you could probably knock this out right now. In fact, I'd recommend that. Uh, just get started now. See if you can do it right now. Pass the test cases. Call it a day. And then you're off for a week, which is a good feeling because it's Labor Day weekend. And I know some of you are raving and stuff like that. So it's, it's a pretty easy assignment. It's just there to teach because it will have you use if statements. It'll have you use variables. It'll have you use C in and C out. And you have a nested for loop for the first time. So it's going to exercise those brain cells uh, in the previous class. The student was like, <clears throat> um, are we going to have partnered assignments? And the answer is yes. Working as a partner, uh, working with a partner is a great way of developing your skills. However, for simple things like this, it's really important you do it on your own because you need to be able to <laughs> make a C out and a C in and a for loop and an if statement on your own. You're, you're worthless to your partner if you can't do that. And worse, what happens when you pair people like that up and they just let their partner do all the coding, they never develop those circuits themselves and they become permanently reliant upon somebody else to actually type out four anti equals zero semicolon i is less than 10 semicolon i plus plus because they've never developed the brain circuits it's like a foreign language you can't go through a foreign language class never speaking right you just let other people speak for you no you will never develop those those mental pathways you have to do it yourself you have to exercise you have to do the side books you know you have to answer the questions do the coding and um if you don't if you're just like kind of clicking through Zybooks, you're kind of cheating yourself. And I've seen it before where students they just click through and they, you know, they Google the answers online, which by the way is cheating. Uh, I can see when you cheat um, on Zybooks. Uh, don't do it. But if you copy and paste the answers again, you're not developing the your your mental skills. This is like a foreign language, but there's only like maybe ten things to memorize. <laughs> Instead of 40 a week, you know, it's it's doable. It's, it's quite doable. You just have to put the time and effort in to just practicing, practice, practice, practice. And over time, it just becomes like you just spit it out. And you need to be able to spit it out because the competency exams are timed, right? So you need to be able to spit out a program like that. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, there will be partnered assignments coming up. Uh, some of my favorite assignments in this class are partnered. Um, but you need to work on your individual skills first. So try and get this done now. Try and get it done like now once I sign off. Uh, class is over in negative six minutes. So in negative six minutes, I want you, <laughs> sorry, integer underflow, in 4.2 million minutes, um, I would like for you to start writing the code. And on Friday, if you have any problems with it, if you have any questions about it, come to lab on Friday and ask them. And if not, on Friday, we're learning functions, which is the final like major piece in C++. And after that, you're going to know C++. Get your doctorate. Go home. Yep. Week four, you know everything in computer science. So uh, pretty exciting. And we're going to go over standard library functions. We're going to go over how to make your own functions, stuff like that. It takes practice. All this stuff takes practice. But by the end of this year, CSI 40 and then CSI 41, you'll actually know how to program. And you can get a job as a junior programmer. That's what I did. And then once you start programming for real, then you really learn it. You know, and then you keep doing it, then you really learn it. <laughs> and if you're not comfortable, if you're, if you're like, oh, you know, I'd, it's not second nature. Yeah, it's still week four, right? You know, computer science degrees are a four-year degree. 
I didn't actually feel like comfortable and fluent until my junior year, which kind of, kind of corresponds to like a foreign language too, right? Like if you're taking Spanish every semester and you're working at a span, you know, at a Spanish speaking company over summers, by the time you get to your junior year, uh, even if you were never speaking Spanish before, uh, you know, you're going to be probably starting to get kind of comfortable with it around then when you're a freshman. Um, it, yeah, it, like, uh, uh, yo soy, I don't know, yo soy un gato en mon pantalones, I don't know. So, um, this is how it is. So if, if you don't, if you don't feel fluent, don't worry about it. I didn't feel fluent either until I was about a junior or so. so just keep, keep at it. Okay. So that's it for today. And I will see you guys for lab time on Friday.